a list. Of, oh, <laughs> we are recording now. So when we have a list of monthly expenses, um, food often is the, the last one on the list. And so therefore it becomes the most elastic. It's the one that we have the most choice to shift. Um, and so that means that our food quality and quantity is impacted depending on what, what other bills we have to pay in a month. Um, and that's a real, that's a real scary um, situation to be in. That's a real stressful situation to be in. That's, that doesn't um, provide us with the right to food, of course. And so Randy Hatfield um, is going to kick us off this morning. Randy has served as the executive director of the St. John Human Development Council, um, a local social planning council. Uh, and he's been there since 2002. So Randy is an advocate for social and economic inclusion. He sits on a number of local boards. Randy wants to get loud about poverty and income inequality. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics and political science from the University of New Brunswick in St. John and a master's degree in political science from the University of Alberta and a law degree from the University of New Brunswick. So Randy, I am so happy to hand the mic over to you. Um, Randy will be sharing his slides, which we will um, be able to share out after Loud About Food completes in the next day or two. So Randy, the mic is yours. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a very timely subject we're talking about. We're heading into the cold winter months and I know that homelessness teams in Moncton, Fredericton, St. John, Bathurst to Mary Mishi are all starting to um, develop some contingency plans and deal with a situation that is not unexpected, but uh, certainly disappointing. I'm gonna share some slides with you today as we try to talk about the details that are in the data. Um, I think we need some foundation of economic circumstances in the province to, to get an understanding of, of where we are and just the challenge faced by so many folks. Uh, so a little quote here from Buzz Aldrin, and I'm not sure how he would feel uh, if there were billionaires in space now, but it just uh, talks about conquering space. And if we can do that, then surely we can conquer childhood hunger. I'm going to be uh, reviewing three documents today that we uh, we uh, rely, rely on when trying to get some sense of food insecurity and economic precarity. And, and what that means for, for families in New Brunswick. We'll be looking at a living wage report that we recently released here at the Human Development Council, uh, excerpts from the most recent hunger report or hunger count report that was released uh, earlier this month. And uh, a bit of a spoiler alert, our child poverty report card that we release every year in conjunction with campaign 2000 um, is due for release tomorrow. But uh, I'm happy to share with you um, some of the findings and some of the uh, the data that's in there. Um, $571 is the amount that a single employable or a working age single is eligible for under New Brunswick social assistance. If that person is deemed on a visual inspection to have a certain barrier that prevents them from participating in the labor force, then they could be designated. That then, raises entitlement to the princely sum of $612. If a person is disabled, then in the Brunswick, they get $705 in social assistance. Um, New Brunswick recently embarked upon a social assistance reform wherein it took uh, and paid attention to civil society and increased the exemption, uh, the wage exemption rate that is allowed. A person on social assistance can earn up to $500 a month uh, without it affecting their monthly allocation and thereafter 50 cents of every dollar is allowed to be uh, to be kept by the recipient um, they also excluded from in income uh, child care support uh, the low-income housing benefit and personal injury awards the social assistance entitlement was indexed to inflation but really what that did was bake in uh, bake in poverty uh, when you have no real increase in the rates, then you're looking at even the $2,021, um, 612 if you're designated, or 571 if you're not. So that, to me, then raises the question, well, what does a person need in this community, in this province, 
um, to participate, to belong, to live with some sense of dignity. So in an attempt to come to that uh, number, uh, we adopted the, the national living wage framework that's used throughout the country by communities to calculate the amount it would cost to raise a reference family of four, two working age adults working full time and two children aged two and seven. <laughs> we calculated living wages uh, first in New Brunswick in 2018 in the city of St. John and calculated a living wage of $18.18 .18, uh, with some assistance from the Economic and Social Inclusion Corporation last year we calculated our living wages for four communities in uh, New Brunswick, Moncton, Fredericton, St. John and Bathurst and we repeated that exercise this year to calculate 2021 uh, living wage rates that you can see on the screen in there. The highest in the province was the capital city Fredericton at $21.20 Next was St. John at 19.75, Moncton at 18.65, and Bathurst at 17.50. This is a bare bones budget that's uh, created, uh, looking at 10 expense categories. Now, this is the St. John Living Wage uh, more detailed report that looks at the expenses that a family of four would incur. Uh, it will come as no surprise to anybody here today that shelter uh, is um, increasing. Uh, in costs, and it is um, hampering families' ability to uh, participate fully in New Brunswick society. Shelter costs were highest in Moncton, Fredericton, and St. John in the calculation of living wage and the 10 expense categories. Uh, the next ones were food and childcare. Um, all we can do when we calculate our living wage is look backwards, not forwards. So we are using the best data possible uh, using the National Living Wage Framework. So shelter uses CMHC data, uh, food looks at a market, market basket measure and uh, adjusts it for, uh, for core inflation. Uh, Childcare is uh, determined at a community level by investigating prices and availability and affordability. But um, of the 10 expense categories, it will come as no surprise that shelter is first uh, and food, childcare uh, following. This is the expense breakdown in Fredericton, St. John, Moncton, and Bathurst. The minimum of the living wage is uh, located along the top, but you can see shelter costs uh, and food costs, the third one down. To eat nutritiously, adopting this national living wage framework and the data that they recommend that we crunch, um, you can see the costs. In Bathurst, it was the most significant expense. Um, it outpaced childcare and uh, accommodation and shelter. And shelter not only looks at the cost of a, a three bedroom apartment, but it looks at tenants insurance, utilities. Um, it's, a, it's a rather robust formula that again is, uh, is used throughout the country. A living wage in Halifax is slightly more than $20. In Calgary, it's $18.60. So people have, <clears throat> asked a, an obvious question, which is why in a major metropolitan like Cal area like Calgary would it be less uh, of a living wage than in, uh, than in New Brunswick? And that's because the living wage not only calculates in the direct expenses that a family incurs, but it also takes into account government transfers, income supports, and benefits that flow to families along with taxation rates. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in Alberta, where you had more robust, well, you had no sales tax to start with and a very low income tax rate um, and other social supports uh, that have the effect of decreasing the living wage. But if we're looking at New Brunswick, if we're looking at families, if we're looking at the cost of trying to maintain themselves, then uh, this is what we're looking at. The 10 expense categories range from shelter all the way to a contingency plan. They cover the, core, the cost of two courses for one of the working adults to participate in, uh, in a community college to, to take a couple of courses for upgrading. It deals with transportation. The social inclusion piece that's there um, looks at um, arts and, and, and leisure. It, uh, it provides some opportunities for families to, uh, to get engaged in the community. Transportation, as you can imagine, is uh, dependent upon the community that a person lives in. In Bathurst, there is no public transportation. So when calculating the living wage for Bathurst, we had to account for uh, extra taxi trips. Um, 
the living wage framework provides for a secondhand vehicle. So in Bathurst, we threw in an extra pair of snow tires because up north that, of course, uh, is, is an additional consideration when it comes to, uh, to navigating uh, the community. So on one hand, we have living wages that say that uh, it's well beyond the minimum wage in New Brunswick. Uh, the minimum wage is 11.75. It's now the lowest in the country. Uh, so clearly we have a huge gap uh, between what a reference family would need to survive and what the minimum wage uh, in New Brunswick uh, provides. Hunger Count, many of you may be familiar with Hunger Count and the work that's done by Food Banks Canada every March. Uh, numbers in, uh, in, and data is crunched to reveal um, what's happening throughout the country. Um, there are five categories or five data lines that I think are instructive when you're starting to look at um, food banks in New Brunswick. Uh, the total visits, of course, is one. But uh, the age category served, I think, is important. If you look at for those that are under 18, you have about 32% of visits to food bank are meant to deal with the interests and the food security concerns of children. Um, children will arise a bit through this presentation this morning because it, uh, it continues to be incredibly shameful in this province that, uh, that so many young people are off to such a, a, a shaky start when it comes to basic needs. The household types in New Brunswick, based upon March's uh, consideration of food bank data, uh, shows that the largest cohort is single people. Again, no surprise when you think of the low levels of social assistance rates that flow to these working age singles. A single parent families, their families actually account for about 33% of, uh, of visitors to a food bank in New Brunswick. Um, that's pretty much uh, consistent with the national breakdown of uh, household types that use a food bank. Sources of income, social assistance accounted for over 50% of those that attended a food bank uh, in New Brunswick. Um, significantly, 11% of seniors um, are those that are now frequenting uh, food banks. The housing type has a large percentage of homeowners in New Brunswick accessing a food bank, and I think that can be explained by the rural population. Uh, which is about 50% in New Brunswick, and the high incidence of home ownership amongst those that live in rural communities. There are very few renters in rural New Brunswick. Uh, social housing tenants account for 14.2%, and the unhoused, those uh, living in shelters, um, account for 2.3% of the folks in New Brunswick that visit food banks. I'm not sure how easy it is to, to look at this slide. It's, it's in uh, these slides will be available uh, afterwards to participants and I commend to you the hunger count report again recently released that has all of this information as well. Those are national breakdowns of data that talk about primary sources of income, uh, more demographic information based on gender, household types, and the housing type. The final report I'd like to, to talk about is uh, the Provincial Child Poverty Report Card. We've been, reducing, uh, re, uh, we've been calculating and releasing these reports uh, for over a decade now. Uh, we sit on the Steering Committee of Campaign 2000, which is a, a lobby group and an interest organization that has arisen around a, a, <clears throat> an old House of Commons resolution in 1989 to eliminate or eradicate child poverty by the year 2000. It remains a work in progress. And, and sadly, uh, the data that we were able to, uh, to manage, the freshest available to us, suggests that child poverty efforts have stalled in the province. The national report, um, again, to be released tomorrow, so that we have a little sneak peek of what they talk about when they look at food security and children. And the national report claims that for children, food insecurity is associated with poor nutrition, hyperactivity, and inattention, and difficulties in school. We also see associations between food insecurity and poor mental health across multiple indicators in youth. These impacts ripple over the life course of a person and accumulate over generations. Research on maternal food insecurity found that it is associated with postpartum mental disorders and greater likelihood of infants being treated in an emergency department. 
<clears throat> these are the child poverty rates uh, that have been calculated uh, from coast to coast to coast. Um, it's almost instructive. It's interesting when you look at the national map of, of poverty rates and you can see that central Canada, which for us would be Quebec and Ontario, uh, have rates uh, about uh, combined of about 15%. You've got a couple of provinces out west, you've got Manitoba and Saskatchewan that have elevated rates uh, in the high 20s. And then we get into Alberta and British Columbia. The north, of course, is a, a, a separate issue of beginning to get have enough data to calculate the numbers. Small populations, of course, in the territories, but, uh, but large, uh, in Nunavut in particular, uh, large uh, instances of child poverty. The Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic is a region. Uh, you put the four provinces together and you can see Newfoundland, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. Um, it's a world unto itself on the other side of central Canada, and about 20% of the of surmise of the Atlantic population has children and families with incomes below uh, the poverty line. So, um, interesting to observe the lighter blue, which is uh, rates that are below the national average, and the darker blue, which, is, uh, which reflects jurisdictions where the incidence of child poverty um, exceeds the national rate. Um, it's one thing to count somebody as living in all in low income and uh, living in poverty. It's quite another to burrow a bit deeper and to look at the depth of poverty. And that's where we have huge um, dollar amounts that are required by families or individuals to get to the point where they're not living in poverty. A lone parent with one child, for instance, would have, <clears throat> you know, after tax median family income of over $20,000. But the poverty line determined by um, the low income measure, a widely accepted OECD measure, and one preferred by Campaign 2000 because of the relative measure of poverty, suggests that you've got a poverty gap of over $11,000. And that's a huge hole to fill, regardless of cohort. Whether it's a couple with one child, a lone parent, with two children, or a couple with two children, we continue to have poverty gaps that exist uh, of uh, over ten thousand um, dollars. We're blessed with eight cities in New Brunswick. Um, mind you, we have municipal reform underway or under consideration. Um, it's, I, I think it's instructive to look at the eight cities and to see the spatial distribution of child poverty within the province. The lowest rate is in Dieppe, uh, the child poverty rate of 12.2%. Uh, but there at uh, <clears throat> up north in particular in Campbellton and Bathurst, rates of over 30%, um, only matched uh, in the south by St. John, that has, um, that has a child poverty rate uh, of 32.4%. The overall poverty rates that have been crunched in these cities uh, tend to be less than the child poverty rate. The overall poverty rate, for instance, in Edmonston is 20.9%. It's not shown on the slide, but it is uh, two points lower than the child poverty rate. In Fredericton, the overall poverty rate is 19.7%. Uh, in St. John, it's 23%. Moncton is 20%. Uh, Dieppe is 11% for an overall poverty rate. Uh, Miramichi is 18, Bathurst 25, and Campbellton 28.6. Um, yeah, there are two. A, sorry. Randy, as you take a quick breath, your time yes. is running, running short. So you can. And there another... it is. Well, and, that's oh. pretty much where we have. How's that for a big thank you? Um, well. I'm sorry if this sounds a little disjointed. I was thinking there were three products that we have available to us that I think can demonstrate the income inadequacy that persists uh, for a large number of families and cohorts uh, in New Brunswick. And um, I hope I'm looking forward to hearing the other two speakers and then maybe uh, participating in a QA. Thank you. Randy, thank you so much for um, sort of yeah laying the laying the base for us all here to understand what is the status, where are we at with income for folks here in New Brunswick, um, and so the next speaker we will welcome is Aditya Rao. But before I share who exactly um, Aditya is, and I think I'll 
I've, I've been told to, sh to call him Addy, which I think is still okay, right, Addy? Okay. <laughs> um, I want to encourage our speakers to please, um, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but if you have questions, uh, I'll invite you to please put those questions in the language of your choice into the chat box. And then once we, once we go through uh, with Addy's um, talk and with Mark, then we'll, we'll have some time for some Q&A. Um, before we wrap up to go to lunch, actually, and so, uh, or to go to break, perhaps. And so, um, and so I'd like to welcome Aditya Rao, uh, or Addy. Uh, he's one of the founding members of the New Brunswick Coalition for Tenants' Rights uh, and is a human rights representative for uh, Canada's largest union, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, QP. And I know that, you know, we, we, we're likely all aware of uh, lots of news around um, the Canadian Union of Public Employees of late here in New Brunswick. And so he uh, is here in the maritime regions. He works on stolen Mi'kmaq, Wolostuk, and Pessamaquoddy uh, territories here in New Brunswick and PEI. And he's based in Fredericton. Addy is a board member of the Atlantic Human Rights Center at St. Thomas, uh, St. Thomas University and a member of a governance board of the New Brunswick Media Co-op. He is also a producer of the NB Brief. It's a talk show broadcasted by CHCO TV over in the St. Andrews area, uh, but that broadcasts all across New Brunswick uh, and, and all across Canada as well. And they focus on social and economic justice in New Brunswick. Uh, before joining QP, Addy worked for Amnesty International Canada. And so without further ado, Addy, I will hand the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Gilles. Uh, C'est toujours un défi de suivre uh, un grand homme comme uh, Randy Hadfield. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, mon nom est Adete Rao. Je suis tellement content d'être parmi vous ce matin. Uh, je vous rejoins de la territoire volé ce matin des peuples Musqueam, Squamish et Slaywatut ici à Vancouver, en Colombie-Britannique en fait. Uh, je vis et travaille normalement sur les terres volées des Wallace des Mi'kmaq et des Peskotumakati, comme Gilles uh, a dit tantôt, à Fredericton. Um, ma présentation ce matin sera en anglais, alors uh, je vous demande d'activer l'interprétation si vous en avez besoin. Uh, my message to you all this morning is very simple. Our struggles are, are linked. It feels particularly relevant that I'm speaking to you from British Columbia, where the people of this province are suffering climate catastrophe after climate catastrophe, exacerbating what was already a crisis of access to basic human rights, such as housing and importantly, food. You've all seen the images of grocery stores with barren shelves in the days following the massive flooding. The government of BC acted swiftly in imposing a rationing of gasoline to ensure access to fuel for everyone who needs it. But this means there are now police stationed at gas stations to enforce this order. It is as though we are living in a dystopian future. While the people of this province experience one catastrophe after another, the RCMP continues indefensible, colonial, and heavy-handed operations against indigenous land defenders, trying to protect their communities from the devastating uh, environmental impacts of the coastal gasoline pipeline. Well, speaking of ignoring indigenous rights, engaging in industrial activity that is inviting climate disaster, and presiding over a housing crisis, let's talk about New Brunswick. I want to focus on three things this morning that we need to address in New Brunswick if we want to address food insecurity. First of those things is housing. We are living in the wild west of the rental market here in New Brunswick. Tenants in New Brunswick have far fewer rights than tenants almost anywhere else in the country. New Brunswick has no rent control. This has meant sky high rent increases for New Brunswickers that have all been completely legal. 10%, 20%, even 100% and 200% rent increases. Over the last year, we have received calls on a nearly weekly basis at the NB Coalition for Tenants' Rights from people facing rent increases, people who simply did not know what they were gonna do. I'm willing to bet that everyone on this call today has either been directly a victim of a rent increase or know someone who received a rent increase. One family in Moncton received a rent increase of $2,000. This was only reversed after public outcry because it was completely legal. These rent increases, as immoral as they have been, have been completely legal. When you receive a rent increase, there's very little you can do about it as a tenant. 
if you don't like the rent increase, you can ask the tribunal, the tenancies tribunal, but they have almost no power to stop it from going forward because there is no rent control. And then if you can't afford the rent increase, the legislation says you can just leave. And in a market where there is no vacancy and where there is no rent control, these rent increases amount in our view at the coalition to forced evictions, something that is illegal under international human rights law. New Brunswick is in fact, fundamentally non-compliant with international legal standards established on the right to housing. In our province, it is perfectly legal for a landlord to unilaterally end a tenancy for absolutely no reason, simply because the lease agreement has ended through what's known as a non-renewal of the lease. This is not normal. And in fact, it is in violation of the international legal standard for the right to housing known as security of tenure. Security of tenure is a basic protection that says the tenants should not be arbitrarily evicted. In New Brunswick, perfectly legal to arbitrarily end someone's tenancy. This means the tenants are living in precarity across the province, not knowing whether they'll have a place to live in at the end of their lease agreement. And before you ask, no, the recent amendments proposed this year do nothing to fix the problem. There are protections against these arbitrary evictions when a tenancy reaches five years uh, and turns into what's known as a long-term tenancy in the act, but it has become common practice for landlords to end tenancies before they even get to five years and with no penalties for doing so. It's also a violation of the right to housing to allow evictions into homelessness. But in New Brunswick, there are no protections uh, against that. It is also illegal under international law to allow evictions without access to legal aid to fight evictions. Well, if you live in New Brunswick, tough luck. There is no legal aid for tenants in New Brunswick. That's why we at the New Brunswick Coalition for Tenants' Rights started the Tenant Advocate Program. That, by the way, was only made possible thanks to the generous support of uh, Randy Hatfield and the Human Development Council. We want to do what we can to fill the gap that the government has left to help tenants navigate this awful system. Our Tenants Advocate is providing legal information to tenants across the province in three languages, English, French, and Spanish. We wanna make sure that tenants know their rights and can get, help they need, get the help they need to figure out how to challenge their landlords. You might be wondering, what is the government's plan with respect to affordable housing? Well, we think they have their heads buried in the sand. Let me explain. There are some 5,200 people on the wait list for affordable housing right now. The government plans to build, give or take, about 1,200 units over 10 years. Meanwhile, we have a major predator in town, real estate investment trusts. These are companies who have no interest in affordability. They are only interested in maximizing profit. Just one of them has plans to convert nearly 1,300 affordable units in the next couple of years into high-income rental units. We know this because we read their company prospectus. Who knows what all the private developers have planned who have to disclose nothing. With every step forward, we're taking not one, not two, but 10 steps back. The government says they have a solution. They're proposing cutting the so-called double tax as a silver bullet to fix the problem. Those of you who follow these debates have no doubt heard of this so-called double, ta double tax. Well, let me disabuse you of the notion that this is at all a credible policy proposal. The so-called double tax is a provincial tax that is levied upon municipal taxes on top of municipal taxes on properties that are not occupied by the owner of the property. Because two levels of government, municipal and provincial impose a tax on one property, it's being called a double tax. The argu argument goes like this. The tax should be removed because it is uniquely only found in New Brunswick. It increases costs on landlords, which they have no choice but to pass to tenants. And so eliminating this cost will result in lower rents. And three, removing this tax will help incentivize more housing to be built. Well, first, we need to be clear, this is actually not a tax. It is a homeowner's tax credit that is not applied to non-owner occupied units. This means that it is not landlords being penalized. It is actually home ownership and residency being incentivized. But we don't need to get into the weeds of tax policy to know why removing this is a bad idea. First, let's get the argument that it is unique to New Brunswick out of the way. This is not true. Provincial and municipal taxes exist at the same time all over the country. Sure, this tax is higher in New Brunswick than in some other places, but it is not unique. Second, with a rent control, cutting the double tax will do nothing to reduce rents. There will be nothing stopping corporate landlords from pocketing the savings. Some landlords have said that they will freeze rents, 
well, we can't rely on the charity and benevolence of landlords for public policy decisions. And in fact, corporate landlords actually can't pass on savings to tenants because corporate landlords have an obligation to pass on their profits to their investors. And it is a legal obligation to keep rents as high as possible. And finally, if we remove this extra cost on landlords, then New Brunswick, which is already seeing higher than normal activity by predatory real estate investment trusts, will see even more such activity. So removing it will actually make the crisis worse. So no matter what we talk about, it always comes down to the basic protections we're missing in this province, rent control, tenants' rights. The solution to the housing crisis is not in the market. The market has never built affordable housing, never ever built affordable housing. When it has built affordable housing, it is only through government subsidy. This is why we're saying, let's stop relying on the market. Relying on the market has brought us to this crisis in the first place. We need non-market housing, non-profit housing and cooperative housing. What we don't need is more tax breaks for landlords, which brings me to my second topic, the struggle for fair wages. All of this is happening while New Brunswickers are struggling to pay for basic necessities. We know that about 50% of New Brunswickers, uh, New Brunswick renters, are in some kind of housing unaffordability. 50%. We know that 36% are paying over 30% of their income towards housing, and 14% are paying over 50% of their income in housing. New Brunswick has some of the highest child poverty rates in the country. According to the Human Development Council, as you just heard, 32% uh, of, of children in St. John are living in poverty. Nearly 40% of the children in Campbellton are living in poverty. A full quarter of the children in Moncton and Fredericton are living in poverty. On top of this, federal statistics show that 25% of single mother households are living in food insecurity. What's the government's answer to this? Raise the minimum wage by an insulting nickel. New Brunswick is now the lowest wage jurisdiction in the entire country. As you all know, I work for the Canadian Union of Public Employees. We're the largest union in the province of New Brunswick, representing 22,000 workers. Our members work in hospitals, nursing homes, schools, courtrooms. We make sure our municipal wages are managed, ensure that we have clean drinking water, and provide care for the elderly. Despite all of this, QP members were being asked by this government to take zeros at bargaining tables, even though our members put their lives on the line during this pandemic on the front lines to keep the people of our province safe. In fact, rather than pay fair wages to the people they called heroes, this government forced our members to go on strike. 20,000 workers were mobilized to strike in what is a strike action now that is larger than the 1992 general strike. And why? To fight for wage increases that kept pace with cost of living. That's all our members wanted to ask for. And even then, Premier Higgs wanted two QP locals to give up their modest pension plans that paid their members an average of $9,000 a year. Well, the Premier worked for the Irvings for over three decades. He has an executive level pension plan, one that I am sure pays him significantly more than $9,000 a year. We don't know exactly how much, by the way, because the transparency rules for our elected leaders in New Brunswick are atrocious, and because the Irvings don't have to disclose anything as a private corporation. The Premier used every weapon in his arsenal to attack his own workers from using emergency powers supposed to be for COVID to force his workers back to work in violation of constitutionally guaranteed right to strike to using the Irving owned media to push his propaganda. And let me be clear, the Irving, Irving media were relentless. The op-eds, the articles, and even their experts. One of their experts, Jim Leach, another former business executive said in a Brunswick news column that QP members were kidding themselves to expect the province to pay uh, the pensions that they were promised. But what was conveniently not mentioned is that Mr. Leach earned more than $40 million in compensation during his years as an executive of the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. How much does he get every year in a pension while he attacks workers? An estimated $315,000 per year since 2013. Folks, the name of the game in this province is corruption. So that brings, my, brings me to my final topic, corruption. Earlier this year, Irving Oil sought approval from the Energy and Utilities Board to get an increase in gas prices. Spoiler alert, they failed. They failed because a coalition of civil society members intervened. QP, the Common Front for Social Justice, and activists in St. John, Fredericton, and Moncton. The Irvings wanted their profit margins to increase by over 50%. That would have meant an increase in home heating costs for New Brunswickers, an increase in prices every time we filled up gas. Had they won, with inflation what it is today, gas prices would have been even higher than what they are now. At the time, Robert Jones of the CBC crunched the numbers. 
we would have paid upwards of $60 million more as a province. And the Higgs government was absolutely behind the Irvings. No surprise, Premier Higgs is a former Irving executive. The Irvings say jump, Premier Higgs asks, how high? Well, a minister of this Irving government, Minister Holland, went so far as to send a letter to the Energy and Utilities Board in support of the Irving application. A naked attempt to influence the independent tribunal's decision in complete violation of ministerial, ministerial norms. What's even wilder is that even the legislation is written to give the Irvings an advantage in the process. Get this, Irving Oil had submitted some evidence for their application, information relating to costs associated with the entire supply chain of oil production. And even though we were interveners, ostensibly there, to make the case on what we think about their application based on the evidence, we weren't even allowed to see the evidence. The law says that they can assert confidentiality on pretty much anything relating to costs and business operations. When we challenged their claim for confidentiality, they said that we had to prove that the evidence, which we could not even see in the first place, was not confidential. It was Kafkaesque. In their submission, the Irvings were using their virtual monopoly to say that if they don't get what they want, there will be a crisis of supply. They wanted to hold New Brunswickers hostage until they got what they wanted. This was nothing but pandemic profiteering. And we thought this was unacceptable. Our, our argument was simple. We will not be held hostage by these tax avoiding billionaires. Yet again, we saw the same story play out. We have the richest family in the province of New Brunswick trying to balance their budget books on the backs of ordinary New Brunswickers. To sum up, we cannot have food security in New Brunswick while we allow a housing crisis to continue, income inequality to, in, income inequality to persist, and billionaires to rob us of the wealth that all New Brunswickers should be able to share equitably. But it is collective action that can make this happen. At the EUB, the Energy Utilities Board, it was collective action that stopped the earnings from getting their oil, in, oil price increases. For wages, it was workers mobilizing across the province, from Dalhousie to Sackville, from Capelle to Woodstock, it was workers mobilizing across the province that forced the government to back down. Even with tenants' rights, although we were not consulted on the new legislation, and although it is awful new legislation, we would not have had new legislation without tenants mobilizing across this province. We are at the cusp of a reckoning in this province, and it begins with all of us. It is past time that we said enough is enough, that we demanded fair wages, that we demanded rent control, and that we demanded that the rich pay their fair share. So I firmly believe that we will see a province where no one goes hungry. But being loud about food means organizing and mobilizing with one another in solidarity and collective action to demand social and economic justice for all. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Addy. So you've given us so much to process and consider and to get loud about um, without losing too much time in between now and our next speaker, I will jump right in to present Mark Beliveau. Um, Mark is the executive director of Harvest House Atlantic. He comes uh, with a background in business management and organizational leadership, and his career uh, began working for Irving at the head office supporting customers and running high-level KPIs. Uh, that, that's not a black mark on you, Mark, give it our, our, just our last uh, presentation. The next eight years, Mark worked within the emergency management program with the Canadian Red Cross, and his role brought him across the country many times to support natural and man-made disasters. In 2019, Mark joined Harvest House Atlantic, where his passion to help those most vulnerable help shape unprecedented growth within the organization. And so since joining uh, Harvest House Atlantic, Mark has helped increase the capacity of the work being done by opening a new women's addiction recovery program, expanding the skills and employment program, and he's grown the workforce to help more people each day. So thank you so much, Mark. I'll hand it right over to you. Thanks so much, Jill. Um, so I guess, you know, I love the stats from Randy. I've, I read them on a regular basis. Uh, they do tell a lot of the story. Um, and it's great to hear Addie's uh, passion. Um, we see a lot of the effects on the front lines uh, of, of what Addie was speaking to, which I'm gonna share with you uh, just really uh, more storytelling, but to give you a real clear uh, view of what it looks like on the front lines. So just to back up Harvest House, we've been in the city of Moncton for 24 years, about to enter our 25th anniversary in January. Um, we supply uh, beds, heads on beds every night for 109 individuals in our community. 
So that's 44 people in shelter, 31 people in addiction recovery programs, and uh, 34 people in transitional housing. And so uh, if you think of 109 people, we see every scenario that has been presented today whether that is um, where there's people who have to choose between housing and food, uh, people that uh, have seen rent increases and can no longer uh, afford to live in their apartments and are living in their vehicles. Uh, we see people who are receiving the 571 per month from social development and unable to uh, supply what they need for themselves and their families. Um, through it all, we continue to grow. And it's unfortunate that we continue to grow because the need is there. And so by the end of 2022, uh, we will have 150 heads on beds every night. Uh, we're actually entering into the affordable housing market through Rising Tide in Moncton um, as a not-for-profit uh, housing um, entity so that we can help support more people who need housing. Uh, we're seeing a, a large um, a large increase in individuals that we call uh, need to be di uh, diverted from shelter. So we think of anybody on this call, you have an apartment, uh, they and, and our IT comes in, they do renovations, they increase the rent to an astronomical rate, you are forced to be evicted, and you end up at an emergency shelter. Um, it's very difficult for people to understand, but it's happening every day. And so what we try to do as an organization is ensure that people do not end up in our emergency shelter system. So one thing I'll be very clear, and you know, I came into this sector with a very different view on homelessness than many people. So most people who work in this sector have come from homelessness, come from addiction themselves. At our organization, we have 50 staff, full-time staff, and half of them come from lived experience. So they've been homeless themselves, incarcerated, um, addictions, uh, some sort of mental health and addiction in the past as well. Um, and so we have plenty of people who look at this from the viewpoint of the people on the front lines. I come in with a different view. I come in with trying to think of ways that we can eliminate um, the use of, uh, of really sterile and emergency shelters. We don't want to be a society that relies on emergency shelters. The reality is people need housing, people need fair wages so they can make a living for themselves and their families. But that's a long-term uh, strategy to get there. And so our, our goal is when people come to emergency shelters or come to our door, uh, we divert them into transitional housing. If we can find affordable housing, we'll do that. However, given the market the way it is, it's very difficult to find um, housing for individuals. And so we're investing heavily next year into the affordable housing and transitional housing market to make sure we can create more opportunities to help people transition from homelessness into housing. Uh, one thing that I think that people might find interesting, um, Jill talked about the beginning of, you know, people have to decide between paying their bills or having a healthy meal. As an organization and many other not-for-profit organizations, we deal with the same thing. And so uh, at Harvest Health, we have a $2.3 million budget per year. Uh, we receive $111,000 in government funding to support the work that we do. The rest of our funding comes from public uh, donors. So we are working harder to try and find revenue sources to come in and help the people in our care than we're receiving assistance to do uh, ourselves. Um, for food, so just to put in perspective, this, this is a food conference. Our budget uh, as an organization for our emergency kitchen, which it does three meals a day uh, and has never does never shut down, is $24,000 a year. And so that makes 109,000 meals a year on $24,000, which means we fully depend on our community around us to get healthy uh, and balanced meals to people in our care. We don't wanna be just another place where people can eat mac and cheese. We wanna actually provide balanced meals that people are going to become healthier uh, and more stable uh, in their environments through the food that we serve. And so when we think of things like COVID, it's really set us back quite a bit. Um, we could no longer receive homemade meals um, or from groups bringing in food to help supply uh, our, our emergency shelter guests or even guests in our programs. Uh, we had to stop all volunteers from coming into our center for the past four months because of COVID outbreaks within the homeless community. Um, you know, we couldn't accept, so we actually had a COVID outbreak in our shelter and we could not accept bulk food distribution uh, for a month. That was absolutely horrible for us to try and manage an operation without receiving that bulk food. And, you know, we talk a lot, you know, or we haven't talked a lot about it, but CERB has really set us back. Um, so we have a lot of people in our, in our care that 
received CERB, um, although they were living in uh, emergency shelters. Uh, many, you know, two, three, four would go together, find an apartment, use their CERB money for that. Um, but they didn't have the skills necessary to maintain and keep those housing units they were able to secure. And so they ended up back into our mercy shelters, but uh, then blacklisted from, from tenants within the community because they just could not be, they didn't understand how to be full tenants. Um, and then one of our biggest challenges right now from a food perspective is how do we teach people that have been reliant on soup kitchens and emergency shelters for many, many years, how to start shopping on a budget, how to prepare the food um, themselves, how to prepare food for their families. Um, you know, as, as not-for-profits with, with very thin budget lines, how do we find the capacity to support people with that? And, you know, maybe that's a question we will put out to, to the people on this call is, it, are there, you know, are there agencies, are there avenues available that could help us with, with, uh, with providing that training to individuals as much as possible? But the reality we do see on the front lines is that we have uh, not only a growing homeless population, and again, I'm only speaking to the city of Moncton where I am, we have a, a very rapidly growing homeless population, but because of rent increases, because of, uh, you know, people just not being able to afford the basics of life, uh, choosing between shelter and food, um, we are seeing a lot of people who are coming first time homeless or unhoused. And unfortunately, we don't have the structures in place to support them. Our shelters are full. Um, affordable housing is hard to find at best, even if we can. And then we have such high levels of mental health and addiction within our communities and very long waiting lists. Um, I have an individual who needs help with mental health and addiction. He's on a six month waiting list and I would say he's borderline suicidal. And so here we are trying to support these individuals, but the, the structures that are supposed to be in place to support them are not there. And so you know, that, that's the doom and gloom uh, of, of what I wanted to share, but there is hope. Um, we do see people moving forward. We do, through the passionate work uh, of our staff and within the community, see people who are making their way out of homelessness, getting help with addictions, uh, addiction and recovery services, moving their way into transitional housing so we can help teach them the basics of securing and maintaining affordable housing. And then we're being, seeing people succeed. Once we can get them into the housing uh, sphere, either transitional or affordable, we help people secure jobs. Uh, we have three of our people that a year ago were homeless and, and addicted to crystal meth who are now going to uh, Olton's College through a partnership we have with them to further and better their lives. Um, we have our first woman that came into our addiction recovery program who today has now uh, regained custody of her two boys and is uh, now working for us and has really gotten her life back after 20 years on the streets. Um, we do see hope happening, but the reality is there are too many people that do have to choose between shelter and food. And what we see every day, because unfortunately at nine o'clock when our shelter is full, we have to turn away everybody at that door. We have more people who are sleeping on the streets solely because we cannot find the funding or the structures in place within the communities to help support them every night. Um, so, you know, I, I like to be a solutions focused person. Um, you know, the reality is we do need to have more housing. I think Addie is right. We need to look at uh, not-for-profit housing and that is, that is starting to take off um, through rising tide initiatives in Moncton. I know that there's new initiatives in St. John of Fairton as well through John Howard and different organizations. Um, but it can come soon enough. We absolutely need, uh, we need people to step up and we need uh, property owners to start opening up units to those uh, who need them, uh, whether it's social housing, whether it's you know, subsidized rent, we just need to find a way to create more beds available for people so that we don't continue a cycle of emergency shelters um, of you know, two, three days in detox and then right back on the street. We need to find a more sustainable uh, solution. And I do believe that, um, that it's out there. I just think that we need more resources in place to help us move things forward. Um, as organizations, we work together. We work really closely to try and bring this forward. Um, and you know, there's, I think there's a lot of people on this call that probably have a passion to bringing safe, nutritious food uh, to individuals, uh, not just in the homeless community, but you know those who are precariously housed as well, that are one paycheck away 
from, uh, from seeing homelessness at their front door. And so how can we support them in doing this? And I think I'll leave it there because I think there might be some questions coming up. Uh, but Jill, I, I don't want to take too much time. I'd rather wait for some questions to come through. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, we have someone that has been pulling Q&A. So I don't know how many questions have come through, but I'll, I'll just, I'll pause to, um, to open up for that. Yeah, so we've had a few, a couple of questions come in. Um, all right, let's this time, uh, we have Carrie Bedford who's asking uh, Mark, I think this came for you specifically. Um, do you see connections happening with emerging community food centers uh, or food banks collaborating with Harvest House organizations? Certainly. Uh, so one thing that's interesting over the past couple of years, so I'm a new executive director from the past two years, and I've come in with a little bit of a different view on things of working more collaboratively uh, with different community agencies. And so one thing that we have done is we have now um, joined Food Equality Montaire and have started to receive the food uh, that we desperately need within our shelters. And so we're getting more bulk food as well as uh, more balanced food. Um, unfortunately, the amount of mouths that we're being asked to feed now at 109,000 meals a year, um, it's really hard to find that sustainability. Uh, last summer, we did do our first uh, partnership. It was called 5,000 Farms. It's a farm outside of Moncton, and we uh, provided our, um, our addiction recovery men and women and some people from our shelter out there to learn food skills within farming. And so uh, trying to think of ways to provide further employment opportunities for them, they help to farm um, and bring in a crop from that farm. And part of that will come back to us at the food bank or at, at Harvest House as well as the food banks. And so we're trying to find innovative ways, um, but it has to be more collaboration with the different food banks and food centers for sure. I think for all emergency shelters. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, we also have uh, Suzanne White who has uh, made the comment of uh, John Howard from Uptown has been developing training courses for teaching life skills necessary moving into the, uh, that long-term housing uh, section. And she also has a question um, for Randy. Uh, let's read this out. Um, there. Uh, do you see any progress in trend lines over time in any areas or in any locations in the province that suggest improvements in living conditions? Um, I think we've seen um, heightened investments by the federal government that have had uh, an impact here. We trace in our child poverty report card the impact of the child uh, tax benefit um, as well as other transfers, there's no doubt about it that if you have um, robust payments for, for health, for childcare in particular, New Brunswick and Ontario are the two holdouts right now of the federal package that's meant to get uh, affordable daycare in place, the $10 a day Quebec model of daycare. Uh, when that happens, we'll probably see a decline in um, uh, a living wage that's required in a community and we'll see uh, improved outcomes for children over time. Uh, it's interesting, I think, to, to look at um, municipal reform and what the province is suggesting. Um, they're suggesting that these regional services commission uh, take ownership or have some responsibility in some social files. And so that's an interesting departure from the 60s revolution of equal opportunity, which was meant to overcome sort of shameful disparities within the county system of government. And we'll want to spend some time thinking about this and the impact as well on food banks and, and communities where there are you know, cohorts of the population that are particularly vulnerable and marginalized. Um, you know, equal opportunity was meant to do just that, to provide equal opportunity. Sadly, it provided you know, equality to uh, existing inequality. So if you can treat unequal populations equally, then you're in fact, exacerbating or making worse the presenting problems. So the question in municipal reform, uh, from, from our point of view, is um, if Moncton, Fredericton, and St. John all of a sudden through regional commissions take on additional responsibilities for homelessness or food security or, or mental health services, um, what kind of disparities could we eventually see within at least our, our urban areas? Would we find 
additional supports in Moncton, arguably the most progressive community right now in the province, with they with rising tides and with their social inclusion officer and with their investments around uh, poverty reduction, would they all of a sudden be leaving uh, St. John and, uh, and Fredericton uh, in the dust as they move ahead? So the pendulum is, is, is swinging now into Brunswick from you know, the pre-60s to the revolution in the 60s to you know, the unintended consequences that were unaddressed. And, and now we're having another situation that may impact particular communities' abilities to respond to some of the marginalization. But, but right now, to answer the question as directly as I can, um, we don't see particular communities setting standards that I think are making perceptible differences in, in income poverty. Because poverty is incredibly, no, it's not complicated, but if you look at the definition of poverty that the Economic and Social Inclusion uh, Corporation has in legislation, it talks about opportunities, means, resources, and power. Well, how do you measure that? You know, you don't. We default to a rather crude proxy measure of income. We establish a line that we call a poverty line, and we count those above it and those below it. It's, it's inexact, it's crude, but it does allow us over time to see how we're doing and to longitudinally look at, uh, at some trends. And, and what we're finding right now, using the freshest data available, that sadly doesn't even take into account COVID, but the latest family files from CRA and other sources are suggesting that our efforts are stalled. We, we really uh, have to reinvigorate uh, this whole idea of uh, strong universal social support programs and income supports uh, that can make a difference. Uh, the other cohort in New Brunswick that's, that's, uh, that's, that's wickedly having a difficult time is those with disability. Um, you know, there's talk about a federal disability income support program, and I know that there's a task force provincially that's looking at that particular cohort, but that's uh, that, that's a group of people that is really having a, a difficult time. So uh, overall, um, a stalling of the downward trend that we saw for a couple of years. Um, and we're just gonna have to wait and see what this provincial majority of them is doing as well as the federal minority. And maybe uh, we'll see municipalities uh, start to pick up some, uh, some of the reference as well. Mm. Thanks, Randy. You, you said some words that really sparked some um, thoughts for me. You talked about equal opportunity and, um, and words like power. Uh, and so it, it just, it makes me think about um, equity in our, in our, across our um, communities. And, you know, there's the age old, or, or it's a very popular image of someone, three people standing in front of a fence. I, I'm sure many people have seen it. I, I pulled it up and I will share it here. Um, it's interesting, uh, an article that came up for me around this equity picture. Can I share my screen? So this picture of equality versus equity. And one of the interesting things which, you know, came up with this particular article is, that I had never thought about before, but you know, yes, we do need equity, uh, equitable policies and equitable services and supports for people. Um, and that I wanna note, you know, this picture sort of indicates that each of these people are coming to the table with a little less than the person who is able to see over the fence. And so one of the notes, this, this I mean, this article is, says this equity picture is actually white supremacy at work. And, and what this person says, is, wouldn't it be ideal if what this fence looked like was the fence and that the same, you know, the person of the same height uh, was actually standing on an incline. And that is the reason that they're not able to see over the fence. And so we need to build the fence lower, but we need to remember this power structure, um, the, the ableism that exists in our policies, our social policies, and the racism that exists in our, in our policies. So one question that comes to mind is uh, for all three of you. So I, I wonder, you know, I know that data doesn't exist readily um, to, to show us what is the situation for black, indigenous and people of color as it relates to, um, to housing supports and income supports. Um, as it relates to the shelter system. And then certainly, I, like Adi, I'm trying to think from the perspective of QP in particular, but I'm, I'm sure you could, um, could respond in other ways. Like, what does this look like for, um, for BIPOC folks in our communities? This one's open for, for all of you to speak to. 
We're really hamstrung with data. Um, we've covered in our last two poverty report cards, the 2016 census that didn't take a look at racialized and, uh, and indigenous poverty. Uh, but it's, our, our data collection methods are, are, are weak and we really don't have a lot to, uh, to turn on. It's certainly reflected back in 2016 that is, Saint John, that is New Brunswick wants to emulate other provinces and increase its population through immigration that the trend that we saw in 2016 was uh, elevated levels of child poverty uh, for those people of, of color or and certainly indigenous communities. But the, the, the principal problem we have is, uh, is data collection and analysis. I can uh, I can jump into uh, Jill if, uh, if that's all right uh, um, to add to what Randy said. Couldn't agree more. Uh, there's a uh, we know that in New Brunswick um, uh, we have systemic policism, and uh, uh, just because we know that we're not immune from it, um, and and it would be it it'd be it would just be a, a question of hubris to think otherwise, uh, and and we have. Uh, uh, however, a a, a a government that has refused to to uh, do exactly what racialized communities have been asking for, especially indigenous communities have been asking for, um, in terms of gathering some of that data and ensuring we have uh, the data we need to to address it. But uh, we know that this is a problem also because uh, when last year when there was a conversation uh, globally around Black Lives Matter, um, there was a there was a uh, a push uh, in New Brunswick too to uh, uh, to to look into what it is that we're that that we're facing here in this province, uh, and when I was doing my research for a piece I was writing for the New Brunswick Media Co-op um, on carding in New Brunswick, uh, it turns out that uh, there is no data collected, uh, race-based data collected uh, across the province on on carding, uh, but we know that it's used uh, across the province, um, and and this is of course the practice of arbitrarily stopping people and asking people for identification um, uh, without any suspicion of any crime having been committed committed uh, and we know that this is a practice that disproportionately affects people of color uh black men in particular and indigenous men in particular um so uh so we know that even on on an issue um, uh that we on on a, on a on a practice that we do in new brunswick which we know has disproportionately racist impacts we have no way to measure um, uh, what's going on uh, or, or get a sense of, of what's going on. And even on, on the question of, of uh, tenants' rights and evictions, uh, you know, this year the government released eviction data uh, to, to show that eviction numbers ha have been uh, very low, uh, ostensibly to, 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 make the, to make the claim that, um, you know, we're all crying wolf because the government's position is that there is no housing crisis um, in, in New Brunswick. And, uh, and as we all know, that is, uh, a lie, uh, and uh, um, and they 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 put out all of this information saying, oh, the eviction numbers are low, nothing to worry about. Um, but but ask them how they define evictions, and then there's the there's the devil in the details. Uh, you know, you when you get a rent increase uh, and you're forced out of your home. That isn't that isn't captured by by their eviction uh, data. When your landlord uh, chooses not to renew your lease agreement uh, and and tells you, sorry, you don't have a place to live, that isn't captured as an eviction. Um, when you uh, uh, are are given a rent increase and you and you illegal on an illegal notice and you don't know that you can fight it. Um, uh, and you decide that you can't afford it, and so you leave. That isn't captured in in eviction data. Um, the way the government uh, uh, measures even evictions makes absolutely no sense. And even in the rental review report that was that was done earlier this year, um, uh, which was sort of the ham-fisted attempt to kick the can down the road uh, in February of this year for a 90-day rental review. Uh, at the end, the, the review, as we all know, uh, you know, uh, had contributions from over 4,000 tenants, uh, landlords even, uh, and it said, you know, for over 40% of tenants um, uh, had uh, felt that they were living in substandard housing. 20% uh, of tenants who responded said that uh, uh, that they had been denied housing because they had children, which is a violation of human rights. Uh, it, the, 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 the report goes on to basically lay out the, the, the case that there is a housing crisis, and then ends by saying that there is no housing crisis. And then we asked the government, how did you define housing crisis to come to the conclusion that there was no housing crisis? Guess what they said? They had no definition. The way, the way, the way that this government goes about doing data collection, reporting analysis um, uh, reminds me of my time as an undergrad uh, and the way I did 
my my data canal data uh, collection and analysis when I was an undergrad, uh, and and that is frankly embarrassing. Thanks, Eddie. And so we're at 11.11. Um, it's a complex subject when we try to think about the way that housing intersects with food insecurity, with food security, uh, with workers' rights and workers' wages. There are so many areas to consider. Mark, I didn't, I didn't give you an opportunity to, to share a last word before we head into break. And so um, any, any final words and, you know, maybe all three of our speakers could share the one thing that we're ready to get loud about before we do jump into our break as well. So Mark, you, you're up. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, uh, I think this is, you know, as a food symposium, I would say I wanna get loud with accessible, healthy, balanced meals for our most underprivileged in the community. And so that is not only those, you know, living on the street and using shelters and uh, soup kitchens, it's those people who have finally gained their first housing unit and have no idea how to access or cook the proper food that's going to keep them healthy and help them move forward um, in their lives and the lives of their families. And so for me, it's always trying to find a way, how do we do this better? And how do we make it more sustainable so that we're not relying on a system that is that just can't meet the needs of what we are looking for every day? Mm, and I would say too, whether or not, whether housed or not, or whether um, adequate wages or not. I need cooking help too. And so we need to really spread that joy across community and across socioeconomic levels that we all need these supports as well. Uh, Addie, can I come to you? What do you want to get loud about? I know that there's a couple, there might be a couple of things. <laughs> The, the, uh, I think the thing that I would, I would like to, to, to reiterate simply is we are all in this together. Our struggles are linked. Um, we, we, we cannot have uh, uh, food security uh, while we have uh, economic inequality. We cannot have food security um, while we uh, do not ensure that workers make a living wage. Uh, we cannot have food security um, if, if we let, if we let uh, people rob us of, of uh, our, our communities, of, of the resources um, that we should all uh, be able to, uh, to access equitably. Um, so the, the one thing I would leave uh, all of us with, uh, if, if I could, is, is just that, that our struggles are linked and we're in this together. Mm. Thanks, Addie. Um, that's, that's, that's a really great sentiment um, to connect us all. And Randy, last but certainly, certainly not least, I know you've got lots to get loud about too. So what, what are you going to leave us with? Uh, the importance of solidarity. Uh, and I commend you for organizing this session today. It's really hard in New Brunswick to effectively advocate for change. We don't have an HRM, a Halifax Regional Municipality in New Brunswick which is what, a provincial capital, federal presence, regional head offices, lots of universities and half a million people. We have three principal cities, the largest one, Moncton has what, 72,000 people? So, you know, the suits have always lamented that we have three airports, but you know, try this one on. We have three United Ways, three community councils on homelessness, three community foundations. We have underway a host of containment measures in this province. We're keeping the lid on things maybe, but the chance to go deep is very rare and it's, uh, it's infrequent and efforts like you put together for today and the connections that we're making as civil society and the addition of people in the Brunswick like Addy, it's just a, it's an incredible breath of fresh air and a new sense of energy and, and a renewed optimism at the community level that if we, if we hang together, if we, mm -hmm. uh, if we communicate and, and uh, build trusting relationships, you know, maybe we can move the needle. So, my final thought is solidarity and its importance, its absence in the past, and it's hoped for in the future. That's great. Thank you so much, Randy. And thank you all for being here uh, in solidarity with us through our technical issues and through these wonderful presentations and talks. I appreciate it so much. We will pause for a very short break. We will be back uh, at 1130 with our next session where we're going to talk all about school food uh, and we've got another great lineup of speakers and so we'll move on over. Um, please feel free to click into the next session uh, and we can we can hold on in there and um, yeah thanks for all your solidarity folks we'll see you very shortly. <laughs>